recorded at Get a Grip Studios in Toronto, Canada. A Get a Grip Management production and in association with the Get a Grip on Lighting podcast. Presented by the National Association of Innovative Lighting Distributors, the National Lighting Bureau, the Illuminating Engineering Society, and of course, the International Dark Sky Association. This is Starving for Darkness. Hi there, Michael Colligan here, co-host of the Starving for Darkness podcast with Jane Slade. You know, we talk a lot on this podcast about rethinking things, shifting the paradigm, looking at things differently, and sometimes we struggle to find vendors who support that. And you know what? We found one, Evluma. Go to evluma.com. Their OmniMax Omnidirectional LED Replacement Lamp comes in 2000 Kelvin, Greg Garrick. That's magical thinking from, from Evluma. For sure. And when you're talking dark sky and then Kelvin temperature is a major issue. Mm-hmm. Uh, they And they have it covered. And they have 2K, they have 22K, 24K, 27K, 3K, and then all the way up to 5, which we don't need to get into here, but they have the option. Uh, it's the first truly omnidirectional LED replacement lamp that actually emulates the light center and pattern of the legacy HID bulb. And they can even recreate a historic gas light glow with a bulb. That's the first time I've ever seen that or heard of that. It's magical, man. Absolutely. The magicians down at Evluma, E-V-L-U-M-A dot com. Check out their Omnimax Omnidirectional LED replacement lamp. For right now, you're hungry. You're starving for darkness. Hello, listeners. Welcome to another episode of Starving for Darkness. I'm here with my co-host, Michael Colligan, and I'm Jane Slade, and we are so pleased to have Dr. Alejandro Sanchez here today to talk about light pollution from the point of view of an astrophysicist. Now, Alejandro, I'm just going to recap your very, very long resume here. Um, which is that you've been involved in light pollution since the 1990s. So you've had a really big head start and you've contributed to over a hundred articles and contributions to conferences, many related to light pollution. You're also the leader of Cities at Night, and I want to unpack that later on in the podcast. Um, And you have your PhD in astrophysics, and I'm just so excited to dig in today. So what I want to ask you is we start every podcast with the same question to our guest, which is please tell us about a dark sky experience that you had, does not have to be professional, that really moved you personally, that made you feel like there was something more profound than what we do every day here on earth. So please share that experience with us. Well, for me, probably the the most profound experience that I had in the, in the night was when I was in Easter Island, uh, in one of the beach, in the only beach of Easter Island in the north. I don't remember the, the name now. And, and we were taking some pictures uh, with uh, because we went there uh, to see the total eclipse. Uh, so we went to see things during the day. But uh, but actually, uh, one of the most impressive things was see the darkness, no? The, to be in one of the most remote places on Earth and, mm. and see what is the, the, the it was the, the true nature, not, not in an observatory, because an observatory is a bit, you are in a mountain, it's a special environment. It's not, it's not how a city would look like, no, and mm-hmm. 500 years ago, no. But, but Easter Island is at the sea level. It's true that it's, it's in the it's, it's more to the south than where I live, so the Milky Way is higher. But, uh, but the darkness, no, to see the horizon dark, no. Yeah. That is something that for us is. Uh, it's very strange, no? Because we are also always used to have see these domes of light on the horizon, no? And mm-hmm. and here was the opposite, no? Was that the horizon was very very dark because the atmosphere was absorbing even the 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 light of the stars, no? So so was 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 a really really profound and spiritual 
uh, feeling. Also, I was in a very, very special place now with the Moais next to us and that. But um, but I, it's, it's a place that I I, I'm, I also stopped to to enjoy for a few moment few moments. I'm also a photographer and. And I don't do that very often. I really like to take pictures of everything, take pictures of <laughs> of the solar eclipse. But this this was so so unique for me, no, A unique experience that I really st- stopped taking pictures for some minutes. Wow! It stopped you from taking photos, and I know that's a big part of your work. So. So you, it's, it's, um, I read it that you started in the 1990s, but how did you start your work in light pollution? Well, I started because I was being a victim of light pollution. No? Um, I, in the place that I was living, I, I was just uh, uh, sleeping at night. Normally, uh, I didn't have any street light signing directly into my window. No, so I was sleeping completely window open, no blinds, not, no shutters, mm-hmm. nothing. No? But uh, <laughs> recently, um, there was a big uh, construction near near our house, and in the clear nights, only the moon was disturbing me at night. But in the cloudy nights, the the sky glow of the of this construction reflected on the clouds was enough to disturb my sleep. No? And, and I was already a, an amateur, a passionate astronomer since I was six years old. No? But I didn't thought on the light pollution. No? But when, when this thing was disturbing my sleep, because I was also an, astron- an amateur astronomer, I heard about the, the light pollution topic. And, and I started to dig more and more on, on that. And, and Spain, as we have the, the observatories of the Canary Islands, uh, was a hot topic at the time, no? in, in the mid 90s. I see. Ma, I, see. I, I also live near Madrid. <laughs> <laughs> I see. So you have won an IDA International Dark Sky Association Dark Sky Defender Award for your, <clears throat> your leadership role in the uh, project Cities at Night, which is a citizen-supported project coordinated with NASA and other space agencies that use ISS night imagery. I'd love to hear what that is. I don't know what that is to raise light pollution awareness. So talk about that project. It sounds like it made a really big impact. <clears throat> yeah, mine. We, we are trying very hard to, to make the, the largest impact on, on this field. Um, Currently, the astronauts that are in the International Space Station uh, take pictures. Yeah? They are not truly for fun, right? but as the astronauts can choose themselves to do some outreach, picture, outreach projects or educational projects, uh, is the most fun of their, of their work. No? And many of the pictures that they take from the, from the station are at night. And actually, those are the scientifically more interesting ones because mm-hmm. uh, if we compare the images taken by the astronauts from the Earth at night with the best satellite available currently uh, publicly, uh, some some spy satellites, uh, the militars, and some private companies have something better, no? But but public data, uh, the best satellite that we have have 750 meters per pixel and the ISS pictures the pictures taken by the human astronauts have five meters per pixel so we are wow. talking about hmm. 150 times better hmm. so it's, wow. and, and the, the problem that we had is that <laughs> those pictures were in the NASA archive uh, just doing nothing no, no research <laughs> was done uh, whatsoever with them, uh, mainly because we're quite difficult to find in the NASA archive. No? So mm-hmm. we decided, oh, come on, this is like you have the Hubble Space Telescope only to make pretty pictures because it's true that some pictures appear in the media so from time to time, but it's like that. No, we have 
Uh, the Hubble Space Telescope just for for outreach purposes and not for research. Uh, and and we also mm -hmm. found that there were so so many images there and they were not used. Uh, and many people. So we, we decided, well, this has to change. Uh, but we found that there was a good reason why nobody was using them. Yeah? First, is a human no, who is taking the the pictures. That is, is they make them more difficult to analyze, and also uh, because the astronauts take the pictures in any direction, and the ISS can see around 500 kilometers around them, uh, the images always have around a minimum of 500 kilometers error around them. Uh, and mm. when you are, for example, flying over Spain that Madrid is in the center, it's very clear and very easy to identify. It's very easy to see how that's Madrid. But when you are flying over the East Coast, when you are flying over Germany, when you are flying over China, 500 kilometers can be a lot of places, no? And, mm -hmm. But we thought, well, mm, there's people in those locations, no? So maybe they will be able to identify their own city. And so what we did is was uh, we, we established three parts of the project. One that was just tag the images, just say, oh, this is a picture of a city because the astronauts also take pictures of all things, no? Like uh, comets, the uh, skyscape, uh, auroras. So just to know what is in the picture is a city or is Aurora or is another astronaut. That was the first part. And in only one month, uh, when NASA made the press release about our project, we, we tagged all the archive in wow. one month. Wow. Uh, because the, 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 the appearing in the media was crazy, no? Also, the task was relatively easy, and we only wanted to tag the mid and high resolution images because the low resolution images are there is everything in there. No, there is this, there is the sky, there is the earth. Is were more complicated, no? But for the high, for the mid resolution and high resolution, we did it in one month. Then, okay, once you know there is a city in the picture, you want to know which which city it is. No? That was more complicated and and we didn't have much funds. Uh, we did all this at the beginning with zero budget and we, we managed to get 3,000 uh, images with a, with a location. And then well, it's great to know what is in the picture, but you want to have a map. You want to know, <laughs> oh, this is the... Um, this building, you want to know with this this small town in the picture, not just the, the big picture, the, the big city in the picture, no? Mm -hmm. And to do that, you need to create a map. You have to convert the picture in, on, into a map. And, and mm -hmm. we managed to do that with a round of uh, 700 uh, images. Um, and that was like the first big round and was a great success for us. Uh, later on, we had not had uh, such a big impact because is NASA don't release a press release about your project mm. every day. But <laughs> we have been uh, keep working on this, and now we are we are running another another uh, program uh, with the same goals. Mm -hmm. But now uh, what we are doing is as we have three thousand cities around the world, well, 3,000 images that we already know where they are, um, where it's very tough to identify the images at night, no? because we are not used to, mm. to this kind of pictures. So, so what we ask the people is if they can recognize if a picture that an astronaut has taken already is similar to another one that we already know. No? And right. this uh, currently is, it's called uh, lostatnight.org, mm. and and anyone is like nearly like a game. Uh, we would like that is is was more intuitive and and better, but with the funds that we we made, uh, we're not be able to 
to make it um, for example we wanted to that the people wanted could uh, just check check uh, what pictures they like to locate from their region no but we couldn't uh, so uh, we are happy with this Quick question for you. So I'm, I'm on the website right now, and I'm going to get Scott, the producer, to overlay some of these images in while we're talking. So if you know, while the, while the people are listening um, after, your picture of Montreal is upside down. I think. So I'm, yeah. I'm, yeah, I'm, yeah. I'm looking. I'm looking at Montreal, and Montreal should be the other upside down like that. Like you have it like as if the map of the world had Antarctica at the top, and the Arctic at the bottom. Like I'm looking. <laughs> I'm like that's Montreal, but it's upside down, right? So it's no, interesting. It's yeah, I, I'm not saying it like, but I, I'm looking at it. But what what's really striking me is the you can see the penetration of LED by the color of the lights. Mm, yeah, like you can see how many of these cities were vastly HPS lit um, by you know high pressure sodium lamps, um, yeah. and that you can see these pockets of penetration. Uh, Athens in Greece was particularly noticeable. I was just clicking different ones while you got while you were while you were chatting there, and. Yeah. Um, What's the difference? You know, I, I do you know Dr. Chris Kaiba? Do you know Dr. Chris Kaiba? Yeah, he's, he's quite a good friend of mine. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So he told me. Yeah, he told me that the satellites can't see the the Kelvin temperature above a certain Kelvin temperature. It won't register yeah. the lights in the pictures, but obviously these astronaut pictures are having no trouble with the Kelvin temperature at all. Yeah, exactly. That's why we. We want to make the, the biggest impact, no? because currently the the beers that the, the the images that we are used to to see have these troubles, but the ISS images don't have it. So, so they are gold mine. We already have the solution <coughs> for this, yeah. And and for example, uh, I'm happy to say that yesterday we published uh, a paper about how. Uh, the city of Madrid has changed by putting LEDs, but not only putting LEDs, also by dimming, by reducing the power of sodium lamps, because Madrid was the, the brightest capital on Europe uh, five years ago. And in one year, that was fixed. And they reduced the whole city to 50%. Do you? They introduce it's amazing. LEDs. Yeah, it is. It's amazing. Uh, quick question for you before I like in terms of all this. Um, can when you guys are are photographing these uh, cities, have you photographed like Tucson or I'm sorry, Flagstaff, or or do you have a picture of what a dark sky city looks like? Have you identified Flagstaff or um, oh, I always forget the name of the Mont in Quebec. Um, there's a city in Quebec as well. Uh no, I know it's a Mont. Uh, I can't remember. Um, uh, anyway. Magantic. Uh, yeah, that's it. Um, Magantic. Yes, no. Mont Magantic. Oh. Yeah. Like, have you? Do you have yeah. any photographs of what a what a dark sky city would look like from? Because what's interesting is that whenever you want to accomplish a goal, you want to lose weight, you want to save money, whatever you want to do, you have to monitor first. The first thing you have yeah. to do is check your bank account every day. Get on the get on the scale. You know what I mean? See what you weigh. Like, if you don't check your weight. You have to monitor it first. This is this is so amazing, Alejandro. I, I can't tell you how amazing this is. How are you guys translate? How did that translate into action in Madrid? Mm. Mine in in Madrid. Uh, this this took fifteen years since uh, when I was not a researcher yet. I was a a student and an activist, and and the senior activists were telling to the to the town hall. Actually, you, you you have too much power in your streetlights, no? And and you are spreading all your light into the people windows. Just focus it on the ground, and and you will be saving so much uh, money, no? And and in Madrid, uh, we also uh, at the beginning they they were not believing us. Yeah, they, they they was just not believing that that was true, no? Because it's very difficult to compare your city, get a, get a get a plane and go to another place. Yeah, you you can take your luxometer and take measurements, but always are going to be local. No, it's going to be local measurements. It's very difficult to get an overview of whole city. Yeah? But with mm -hmm. these pictures, with these pictures, uh, you can do it. And for example, if you take that's why 
Riva is such a good friend of mine because I was traveling from the brightest capital in Europe to the dimmest capital of Europe. No, that is Berlin. And, mm -hmm. and we saw how Berlin was three times dimmer than Madrid. Yeah? And London, Paris, um, and many other capitals of Europe were way dimmer than, than Madrid. No, and, and Madrid is not as, as expensive, so as, as rich as Germany, no? Okay, is so, Madrid so is Madrid? Way. Let me ask you something. I don't know if you know the answer to this question. Is Madrid statistically a safer city than, say, hmm. Berlin? Is 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 ne they are both nearly the same? Hmm. They are nearly the same in nearly any any as any question that you ask me. I'm going to say it's nearly the same because they have nearly the same population. They have nearly the same uh, crime statistics uh, in several ways. It's true that, first of all, Madrid, as it's more touristic, they have more, more burglary and Berlin has a, a bit more other kind of crimes. But cult culturally, they are completely different, completely different. No? And not in the nightlife. Nightlife in Berlin is, is, is yeah, it's crazy. much yeah, bigger sure. than in, in Madrid. Uh, the, the metro in <laughs> Berlin uh, is 24 hours a weekend. In Madrid, mm -hmm. we stop at two. We also have great nightlife in, in Madrid, but uh, this shock many people, no? That be, because they think Germany is much more cold, less party than in Madrid, no? But no, Berlin is is very active city, no? Mm -hmm. And and traffic accidents, for example, is uh, in Germany they don't lead the highways. That in mm -hmm. Europe is lit in many, many places. For example, in Belgium, all highways, all roads are lit. In Germany, none. And the traffic accidents in Germany are quite good. I happen are to have good. looked at the light pollution map. Uh, I, I've always visited light pollution ma uh, info. Light pollution map info is the website I typically visit. And I yeah. happen to have looked at Belgium. It is one of the most um, polluted in light. Um, it's it's yeah. it kind of uh, ranks the northeast of it's it's in ranking with the northeast of the United States as well. So um, and that's just so surprising, Alejandro. What you're saying is that it hasn't changed the level of safety. Um, and that's a great question, Mike, to ask because that's really what we're after: is how can we debunk this theory that more light is safer? Mm -hmm. Well, the, the, that's that's the key thing. No? I think none of us wants to turn off permanently the cities. Maybe when there is a migration, it could be a special event. No, but uh, we recognize that lighting is a is a conquer and and make us feel safe, but don't make us really safe. Yep. And the problem is that currently the research is showing that many times. And the problem is that many times, even in, in some examples, so there was a research uh, recently in, in New York, the, the researchers are paid by the municipals or are paid for, for some, someone that has a conflict of interest and they end making conclusions that goes against their own data mm -hmm. yeah so yeah so, so it's very one difficult of the, one of the problems alejandro it can be very difficult when people like there is an assumption that is real at the level of religious that light is good that light at night mm -hmm. is good I mean, if you any you take any kind of religious, um, and you're, like Christ is the light of the world, or you look at the light in the darkness is what we look to, and this sort of stuff. And so it's very deep in us that light at night is safer. But the, and I think it is, and it goes back to our primordial sitting around fires at night and being close to one another. But I think we've gone a magnitude or several magnitudes beyond that in a place like Belgium, or for example, or the, the northeast of the United States, Toronto, these areas, where now the light has gone is so pervasive and so invasive that it's actually having the opposite effect. It's making people less safe. It's affecting human health. It's um, causing some, I, I, my belief is that there's a causal of some kind of derangement with massive amounts of uniform light at night, that it creates like a derangement that we haven't figured out yet. But 
Mm-hmm. How do we get over this? How did you guys get over that in Madrid? Like you literally went to the 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 local municipal council and said, "Yeah, we need to reduce the light level for energy efficiency, and this and that." But come on, you must have encountered the safety people. No, it's going to be less safe. How did you get over that hurdle with them? Yeah, but well, this is funny because we didn't. The town hall <laughs> did this without telling anybody. We didn't mm. notice it. We are experts in light pollution, and we didn't know that the city dimmed the light by 50% until we didn't make the analysis. I was wow. seeing the images of the ISS, yeah, and I was not believing them. Yeah? I was well, thinking, no, no, this is... Because there was a very tricky thing and I'm sorry I interrupted you. Uh, That's okay. The town hall didn't told us that they were going to do it. They told the people that they were going to introduce LEDs in the city, but didn't tell us that they were going to dim also the sodium lamps. Yeah. So and I had so the there... focus on the LEDs only. In lighting, we have a, a, a technical term, L70, which is how long it takes for a fixture to get. In LEDs, they degrade over time, so they lose a little bit of light. So L70 is how long does it take the fixture to get to 70% of maximum output? And I had learned that part of the reasoning behind L70 was that a human will not notice when light levels are reduced by 30%. Um, and now that's sort of when you're in the space with the light. So I wonder, you know, it's not like you're outside hanging out by the street light, watching it dim 50%. So there's probably more, even more leeway in that. But that does go to show that, you know, light levels can be dimmed without really much notice. And I, I was giving a presentation once to um, a, a landscape architecture firm here in Cambridge. And a gentleman came up to me afterwards and he said, well, uh, after he was from Tokyo, and after the tsunami and the earthquake, much of the lighting in Tokyo actually just straight up broke. And he was marveling at the fact that it was still bright. It was still bright enough. And so it just went to, it just goes to show that there's so much egregious lighting that isn't really needed. Uh, so it's just fascinating that you didn't notice. And I think that goes to show that the idea of more light is safer is is really just a a feeling it's not an actuality it's an assumption it's an assumption yeah. that people make they have this assumption that oh there's crime put a light up put a blast a glare bomb out into the that area and the crime will go away and 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 insurance companies lawyers judges they all assume this like you, you can even have liability issues if you don't light up a vacant lot or something and someone gets hurt like the assumption is so ingrained and deep that we have to rip it out, shake off the dirt from the weeds of it, and get rid of it. Because, and I, 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 I so it's interesting that you literally, you know, somehow they, they, they lowered the, the, the output of the lamps. And anecdotally, uh, Dark Sky Researcher didn't even notice. That is unbelievable to me, actually. That is, I mean, it's, it's incredible that you, you, your anecdotal experience, you're watching it, you didn't even notice. That is so incredible, Alejandro. I can't tell you. And it's refreshing. Yeah. Too. So where does Madrid fall now in comparison to Berlin and Paris? Well, we have not done that that, that analysis yet, but probably mm-hmm. considering that Madrid should have uh, deemed to 50%, yeah? Uh, if before was uh, three times, was now should be only one, so... 50% more than Berlin. No? But we have to do that analysis. No? For example, in this paper that, uh, that we have just released is, is not with the satellite images yet. Even we put one example uh, that I can give you the, the link and so you, you can see. But, um, but we, this has been, we have a station taking measurements for more than 10 years in the out parts of, of the Madrid capital in the Complutense Observatory. And, and 
this is the good news, no? The street lighting has really improved the situation. The bad news is that in only one year, all the gain that we got, we lost it. We lost wow. it because the, the, the other things that didn't change, so that they did change because the street lighting in Madrid is supposed to have not changed since then. So the towns around Madrid, that they are quite big, yeah, the, the metropolitan area of Madrid is, is, has as much population as the city itself. The screens, the, the mm -hmm. ornamental lights, all the other things that are not street lighting compensated the whole gain that, that was made. And uh, that's why we, we also want to go to the satellite images and, and try to find that because with the sky glow, looking at the Senate, you cannot tell who is the responsible no, of, 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 the, of this degradation. But, but we see that no? and we see how, how the, the, the sky of the city is getting bluer no? because of the mm -hmm. LEDs. I, I think it's, it's more related with uh, not properly sealed it in terms of the the retrofit was done in a very good way no in madrid but then the put uh, the, the diffusers that uh, is uh, opal also Lamberta, lambertian and diffusers that they fuse mm -hmm. in all directions so what is the point of putting a zero percent eulor picture if then you put something after that send the, the light everywhere. Yeah, the idea of vertical light at night is problematic, like vertical lumen. So you're saying they put diffusers on the fixtures, which then distributed the light to become vertical lumens rather than horizontal yeah. lumens yeah, or horizontal yeah. foot candles. Yep, it's a yeah. problem. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yes, um, it, this reminds me. Oh, go on, Alejandro. No, 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 no. Well, this reminds me of that movie, There Will Be Blood. And when uh, he says, I drink your milkshake because he steals all the oil underground from all the other people around him. And light pollution sort of the same, which is that you can pollute from 120 miles away. And so it doesn't really matter the 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 benefits of street lighting being dimmed by 50 percent in Madrid if all of the surrounding municipalities are slowly encroaching with new LED installations, which could be whether it's technically using a Lambertian diffuser or signage, which is also another problem that we really have to deal with. And um, Mike, I think we should have some signage people on the show and talk to them uh, mano I think a mano. And the, the vertical, the signage is like, it, it's, it's, abs I would say the only description for it, it like the uh, street lighting that has high uniformity is, is problematic. High brightness signs are gross. Like there's no other way to describe them. Like if you live near a like a, a big street sign for whatever, and it's shining directly out, it's very offensive. Um, there, there, it, you know, the way that the light comes into the window, it's like it's like shining a flashlight in somebody's window. Or, and I believe Jane that it's um, also a bigger contributor to sky glow than than street lighting is the vertical. The, uh, horse, the um, signage and vertical, and also buildings that are lit all night long, you know, like the uh, towers and that. These are very problematic instances. Um, yeah, it's a, it's a tough one to, we're tackling it and we're, we're incrementally working before um, towards it. But I wanted to ask you if it's okay, Jane, if I just take a yeah. little side. Astrophysicist, okay. All right, so that's like the, the top level, right? You guys look down on all other scientists, right? <laughs> so there's there's like biologists and chemistry and then astrophysicists are up here, right? How does you, you talked about spirituality, that you had a spiritual experience on Easter Island and you put your camera down and you just couldn't, but you, your humanity, it was being expressed and your relationship to the planet and to the stars and the vastness of the universe. How do those, how do you, what's the right word? How do you, meld those two things how do you bring the spirituality into the cold astrophysics well i i heard this recently from sasa sagan yeah okay. and I, I i've really felt that way no uh, i think uh 
many, many of, of the scientists were like Einstein. No, Einstein was saying that, that for him, God was the universe. No, for, for some people, that means being atheist. Yeah? Mm -hmm. Sure. Um, I think it's strong. No, I think I think if you analyze carefully, no, uh, finding that these mathematical laws that make that being nice to other people, like in, in Christianity, yeah, and and uh, is the mathematical best way of behave, no, for a for a society. Oh, that's 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 fantastic. That is spiritual. That that's telling you that. And for me, is uh, don't get in contradiction. No, uh, the opposite. I, I get. I it gets trouble with me when when we mix not so much the principles, the eth ethical principles that many of these religions has with the tradition. One thing is the tradition and the culture mm -hmm. behind and the arts and, and, and the regional manifestations no, of this religiousness. And then mm -hmm. another thing is the true essence behind of the ethics and, and the spirituality. spirituality no? And for me, being one with the universe uh, is probably the the, the best way of, of feeling spiritual no um, and me the feeling there no, is in and in, uh, in that place was that feeling no and when you ask uh, an astronaut and they, they oh how they to look the stars in the in uh, there in the space has to be amazing and they tell you well not so much compared to be in a very true dark place mm, sure. in, in in earth no because the, the atmosphere of the earth is quite transparent no? sure. can be can be darker no because and, and the darkest areas first of all when you look to the north pole of the milky way uh, is darker in the space no but when I, you I don't look i don't think the we're milky way, the, no the, the, there there is a, it's almost like there's lots of light in darkness like when you're when yeah. you are when you are at Easter Island or you're in northern Canada in Ontario or whatever, there's lots of light. It's not like there's no light. There's lots of stars. There's lots of there's all manner of things that, that you see. But what I was interesting about what you said, like you're what you're saying is like the golden rule: do unto others as you would have others do unto you. Is mathematical equation actually? It's math. Is that what you're saying? Like yeah. these these yes these, yes. Like that's a mathematical principle that if you treat others in a better way that you, life will be good. And we have that kind of mathematics in society and we build that, that type of mathematics will lead to a better place to live. So if you treat yeah. others like the way you want them to treat you or you know, do unto others as you would have others do unto you is math. That's what you're saying. Yeah, but it's, right now there's a, a small modification. Yeah? What, what the game theory say is sure. that do to the others what you want them to you to do. Uh, meantime, they are not being mean to you, no. And sure. If they are mean to you, uh, don't be stupid and, and stop cooperating. <laughs> yeah? Stop but playing the game. In the moment, yeah. in the moment that they stop being mean to you, don't don't be mean. Don't keep me being mean to them, no. It's but like, if all the players, yeah, but if all the players are doing are, are obeying the you know the mathematical rule, the mathematics of the yeah. golden rule. Then you'll have exponential goodness uh, expand in your society. It'll be exponential. The, the the multiplications of that, if all the humans do that, and it'll just continually be, get better and better and better. And that's interesting that there's mathematics in human behavior. I never, I've never heard that before. Huh? Yeah, well, it's, it's at the end is is survival. No, if if being good to other people was not actually good for yourself, yeah. The good night, the next people will extinct, yeah? <laughs> yes. and and that and and this was in the last Carl Sagan uh, book. No? Mm -hmm. were, he was talking about a, a lot of this. How, how could have been? No? How, how could be that being a nice person is actually good for yourself? No? And and mm. and for me it was a finding. No, for me it was uh, a really a nice way of understanding. No, how uh, religions got this bit 
Yeah, when we many times blame them for all the evil things sure. happening in the world, the wars and all that. The problem is that most of those things are not based on the actual Well, war. not only that, but not only that, Alejandro, it's not even that. It's that the history of humanity is the history of wars, plagues, famines, and disasters. That's what history is. If you study history, you're studying war, famine, disaster, plagues. That's what you're studying. That's all it is. There's not really a lot of, and here's what happened during the hundred years where there was no wars. There's not a lot of that in history. But you, let, me, let, me, let, me, let me throw another one at you here, which is interesting. Do you know Steven Pinker? Do you know who Steven Pinker is? No. no. So he, he's, a, he's another, he's a, a nonfiction author who writes about society. I'm not sure if he's a, what, he's a scientist of some kind. But anyway, he says the world is getting better and everything is getting better. And I'm, you know, maybe he's right about that. I'm, I'm not sure. It's like maybe statistics will play that out. But my gut feeling, and when I, and be, even before COVID-19 and pandemics and all this stuff, I think most people had the feeling that it wasn't. And maybe we were becoming wealthier or something. But Jane, I feel like we're, like there's like, a, there's a starving for darkness. Like there's something missing mm -hmm. Jane, in our society mm -hmm. that we don't have. And, and I'm not sure, like Stephen Pinker may be looking at, we have antibiotics and we have uh, all these treatments for diseases and there's less crime. Look at the crime statistics and, you know, all these kinds of things. And he kind of pontificates on these statistics, but I think in people's hearts, they're starving for something, Jane. And I think it's darkness and silence is a big part of the equation. Yes. And, yeah. They are starving. And I've also heard the term, you know, or the, the, concept that the only thing that separates history is art and technology <laughs> so you know i'd like to think that we're getting better and that we have more tools but some of our tools have created more problems mm -hmm. light being the topic at hand mm -hmm. and what i think is so interesting when we talk about morality and do unto others as you would want done unto you is that <clears throat> when you shine a light that creates glare and disruption you actually make uh the neighboring uh experience seem darker so it's really hard to say to the neighbor hey uh you're now blinded through glare don't add another light um for your own ability to see so it's an interesting twist on the problem um which is that you know it's it's like we really have to implore people not to add that light even though it's being added all around them deepening the darkness for them because of the adaptation of the eye so it's an interesting twist on this alejandro i want to ask you from the point of view of an astrophysicist why does night matter to you well for me night matters because it's the 50 percent of the of the earth at any time mm. And, mm -hmm. and one of the problems is that we are completely ignoring it. We are com mm -hmm. It's normal, it's natural, we are daylight animal, yeah? But the problem is, first <laughs> of all, many people don't know that the climate change is happening faster during the night than during the day. Yes. Um, many, all, all our environmental protection, many times is focused on the day. Yeah? Even... Uh, insects, uh, bats, all the creatures of the night is like, oh, they are evil. Oh, I want them to die. Yes. And no, <laughs> mm, no, the the sixty six percent of the species are nocturnal, and they are becoming even more and more because it's where we are sleeping. So they we are left them alone. Yeah. So for me. Uh, is is a drama. It's a drama that NG, big NGOs in the world don't care about the night. Now, light pollution is one of the things that takes out the true nature of the night. No, so even mm -hmm. if there is other issues like climate change, like uh, plastics, like but light pollution takes the essential thing of the night. No, and by not acknowledging the importance of, of light pollution uh, on these big NGOs is just leaving completely unprotected 50% of the globe every, at any time. Yeah? We are finding light pollution has impacts on, uh, uh, in, in plankton, 
in the coral reefs, uh, turtles, migrating birds, humans, uh, and, and even I cannot talk about all the things that I know or we suspect because some of them are still in the research. No? And even mm -hmm. topics like <laughs> cancer, yeah, that is still in a big discussion and we're still working on, on seeing if this theory is actually true, no? that the, the lights can uh, produce an increase of, of, of cancer, is, doing, is being done in a scientific way. Yeah, and, and quite on a discussion. But for example, other topic like security and safety, it's very sad to see that there is nearly no qu good quality research about that. No? So it's like, well, we are destroying 50% of the world, but for a reason to get, to, to get safety, but we are not even mm -hmm. testing if the reason why we are putting the lights is actually effective. So if if these lights were really doing what we claim that they do, yeah, I would be the first one that will, I would want to have an amount of, of light, not on, but only they need it. Yeah? The problem is that right now we don't know. And the problem, the most worrying thing for me is that looks like we don't care because we are not putting investments on making a scientific research on that topic no? and and i think i think that's a very <laughs> irrational movement no and that's 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 my feeling no and the other thing is the inspirational part no if you heard about many of the scientists on the world on the artists uh, the night has been the inspiration for becoming a scientist no, for example, in Spain, mm -hmm. here we have uh, Ramon y Cajal, that was uh, who discovered the neurons. And he didn't become biologist because uh, he loved plants or he, no, no, he became a biologist because he started loving science because of astronomy. Yeah? He saw the 1860 total eclipse in his down and he get fascinated about science and then he became a biologist you know? and this happened to so many people so uh, the sky is a such inspirational thing my daughter three year old she thinks that the moon is her friend no? <laughs> and that science it was uh, one year and a half science she can't talk I, I no? think the a moon is my friend too <laughs> <laughs> yeah, tell her we share it. We have a friend in common. <laughs> yeah. I think the way that you conceptualize night, Alejandro, is fantastically amazing, which is that, you know, a lot of times when we talk about light pollution, we talk about the space, but you really break it down in terms of time and the fact that we are changing this perennial factor 50% of the time. It's it's a staggering change in how we are really living on this planet. And and Mike and I talk so much about the inspirational quality. Um, and I think that's a particular aspect of fascination here on this show, um, because that can't really be measured. Um, but I think that the impact is is very, very large. So it's just and, and there you are, you, you bring it back to your daughter, who is is there connecting with these celestial bodies, um, this moon that stirs the pot for us every single day on the planet. So I, I think that's a beautiful way to conceptualize it. And it's wonderful to hear from a scientist as well, um, the dovetailing of Amen. science and inspiration mm -hmm. um, and that experience. So I, I want to dig into some of your other work, which is um, you talk about the impacts of color and light pollution. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, well, color is color is uh, a topic that because we didn't have the right tools uh, was ignored for a long time in light pollution research. Not not only from 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 astrophysics, also in biology and and, and many 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 other places. No, and and the thing is that even when the people see the black marble they see a fake picture, 
<laughs> because the NASA people tune it to a bit yellowish to resemble the the, the 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 average color of the street lights in the world, but the true image is black and white. No? So um, because the blue light is, is such a trouble, they diffuse much more light, much more in the in the atmosphere, and produce more glare, uh, is much more gross. No? Uh, so you're saying the blue light travels more throughout the the atmosphere than other colors and wavelengths of light. That's no, no, it's, the, it's, 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 it's more diffused. So it needs to hmm. travel less. So if we wanted to to eliminate these domes very far away, the best that we could do is turn to blue lights. Yeah. Oh, uh, the problem is that we're going to completely destroy all the nature around it. Sure. Yeah. But but they, from from far, it's going to be seen less because the the blue light is absorbed and diffused more efficiently by the atmosphere. No. Uh-huh. So so we have to when we think in reducing light pollution, we have to stop thinking in a two D dimension. We have to think in three D dimension in three D. No, we have to think also in the color space. We have to reduce light pollution in blue, mm-hmm. in in green, and in red. Yes, the, the 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 red light in general has less impact. Yeah, in in nature uh, than than the blue light. Or the green light. No, that's why we are focusing right now primarily on the blue light because the LEDs. So until now, all the technology shifts that we had, from mercury lamps to fluorescent to sodium lamps, were reducing the amount of blue light. Yeah? Mm-hmm. And even I have, I have uh, documents from the municipality of Madrid acknowledging this. Acknowledging bluer light mm. is more pollutant, but with the switch to the early stage LEDs, yeah, we went to, to the completely opposite. Yeah? And and at the beginning we had even some malicious uh, manufacturers, mainly buying very cheap LEDs from China, that they were saying that oh there was uh, some kind of Magical way as we will see more uh, more luminance because of the blue light and this. Uh, probably you remember this this uh, melanopic is um, so photopic and scotopic. Is it photopic? Uh, yeah, no, yeah, the, the the scotopic lighting. Yeah. No, the scotopic lighting. Is, yes, uh, sorry, but the scotopic lighting is only worth below 0.5 lux. So if you have a scotopic lighting, I would be very happy. But because that means that your 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 light levels are under 0.5 lux, yeah? and mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. in Spain that don't exist. Yeah, for sure. In the US, but in Spain that don't exist. No? So mm-hmm. they were tricking. They were doing something something nasty. No. Right now the good thing is that for nature we have the ideal lighting now. Now we have PC amber. We have ultra warm mm-hmm. light. Yeah, 2,200 Kelvin. So for residential areas or protected areas, uh, we have all the technology we need. We don't need to invent much more. Well, maybe we can impre- in, in, in improve in efficiency, but that efficiency should not mean more light on the on, on the streets, just less energy consumption. Yeah? And the LEDs has become also all colors. So if for a specific use, you really need 3000 Kelvin or 4000 Kelvin for a sport field, we have it. Huh? So sure. now we have and, the And it's high trend. CRI. There's no issue with CRI. So the, yeah, no, the, no. Old, the old problem yeah. was that with fluorescent or uh, sodium, if you had 2200 Kelvin in low pressure sodium or 2700 Kelvin in high pressure sodium or 3000 K warm weight or whatever, you had to accept a very low color rendering index. It, the, the color rendering index came with high Kelvin temperature. Now that's not the truth. You can have very high um, TM30 or whatever they call it at the IS, TM20 or TM30, yeah. and you can have very high color rendering at low Kelvin temperatures. But I want to I want to throw a little thing in the mix here. Have you ever considered the impact 
Okay, so when you talk about climate change, they talk about carbon dioxide and methane, right? And so yeah. carbon dioxide is like this major problem pervasive, but methane's really deadly, right? It's like, it's super, mm. yeah. I think there's two plays in the, in the outdoor lighting space with LEDs as well. I think you have light pollution and high Kelvin temperature in that, and then you have flicker. So a lot of people don't yeah. know that literally a lot of street lights installed between 2014 and say 2019 are literally flickering off and on twice a second. Okay, so they're flicking, they're going, they're not going like a, a, a halide or a mercury, they're not going down by 10%, like fluorescent flicker was about 30% at its worst. So it went from 100 to 70, 100 to 70. But LEDs will go from 100 to zero, 100 to zero, twice a second. So a lot of people don't realize if you take your phone and put it on slow-mo and point it at your street lights, you're probably going to see that they're actually flashing at you twice a second. And I'm wondering, because remember that fellow we interviewed a, um, a, a couple weeks ago, Jane, and he was talking about how he has all these health effects from 5,000K mm -hmm. LED light. I actually talked to him after the show, and, and I'm not a doctor, and I'm not, but I, I feel like he's got a flicker problem. He's susceptible to flickering lights, not to 5,000. Like he gave me all the symptoms that Dr. Arnold Wilkins and Dr. John Davenport would say are the symptoms of somebody who's suffering the effects of flickering LEDs. How, and, and then not only that though, but also your pictures will appear less bright because literally the lights are going off. So when you snap that picture, a certain amount of the lights will not be emitting any light at that moment when you take the picture. Have you guys factored in flickering at all to any of your analysis or any of your studies yeah. of the of the impacts? Yeah, in in my case, uh, I had not been working with flicker, but uh, I have been thinking a lot on, on on what you are saying. And for example, something that I have found recently, and unfortunately, is not studied enough, is that seems that same Lighting that produce a lot of flicker, like uh, fluorescent lighting, um, also produce some UV. Yeah, and we used to think that humans we were not sensitive at all to UV, but seems that that's not true. <clears throat> yeah, and there is a small amount of UV that we might be sensitive, and if you see uh, what will be if if it's true, because this is in discussion and under research, if it's true that we are UV sensitive, this, the, 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 the symptoms are very similar to the, the symptoms that are described by people that have flicker problems, no? mm. like stress or hormone st uh, higher stress. Headaches. So it's true that headaches, many, 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 many things. No. Um, and I, I, I wonder, no, I wonder if, if there is a link somehow, even if it's not through the UV, because I, I have to say it's a topic in the, in the discussion. Um, but there's 100% a link. There is a link between flicker and disease. That is yeah, not yeah, a, that's the, the not a question. Thing, yeah. No, 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 no. Yeah. Well, I mean that sometimes, so mainly in epidemiology, mm -hmm. uh, we know that is a statistical link, but sometimes we don't know if there is a causal link. <laughs> That's many times in science, the tricky part. For example, uh, my colleague Chris Kaiba has published with other colleagues very recently in colleagues from Canada, um, that indeed the, the air pollution is very, very well correlated with uh, light pollution. Yeah. Mm, I've when heard you that. don't use when you don't use uh, high resolution nighttime images yeah? mm. so that's one of the reasons for example why we want to work so much on the ISS images because then is when we can disentangle mm -hmm. the potential links that the potential things that might confuse these epidemical studies about lighting with uh, air pollution no so yeah, but they are not the same. So, and and we don't know. So, when we talk about cancer, breast cancer, or prostate cancer, we don't know a 
a direct path how air pollution could be a problem. But, and we know that path for lighting, but if we improve our, our data, uh, we, we, we will be able to, to disentangle all these problems. We're coming up on an hour, so Jane's giving me the signal here. But I wanted to just throw something out there and see what you think about it, okay? Because Jane and I are trying to tackle the safety issue. It's kind of like we, we don't know how to do it, right? But it's like we're, we're more like journalists. Jane's like a very – is like a technical – journalist I, I can't I don't know how to describe her but I, she's nurturing the movement okay and I'm kind of looking at this instead of a study that tests whether outdoor light contributes to safety or increases it I would rather see the reverse a study that sees if outdoor light increases crime like instead of instead of taking the pers the assumption that outdoor light increases safety and in looking for it, I think I'd rather see a, like a group of scientists or somebody take the assumption that outdoor light increases cr bad behavior of some kind. And let's see if we uh, can find that. I can give you one example of that. That, okay. that I love it. Uh, all, all women will be very happy of this be done because the problem is that it's not being done. Yeah? Right. It's park, parks, parks. Live mm -hmm. in parks. In Germany, they don't live parks. In Spain, okay. we do. What happened is known that parks is our hot areas for rape. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you can imagine how per se per per safe is uh, is to lead a park mm -hmm. because you the light is known to make you feel safer mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. as you are getting in a park. Where there is a lot of trees, a lot of the bushes, people is far. So if you even just scream, it will be more difficult that they they hear you. So maybe, and and this is an hypothesis. I don't have the proof. I would like that someone does this analysis. The U.S. is the perfect place because you have open data on 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 crime that in Europe is is, is not the case. Um. Hmm. So, uh, checking if lighting or different kinds of lighting in parks improve, o sea, increase rapes or not, uh, will be a, a place to, to look at. No? Or, or, for example, compare countries, no? compare sure. the statistics from Germany to the statistics of other places. Uh, I know this from Spain, uh, uh, for example, in a regular street your chances of being raped is around 14 or around that around that value in a park is 21 hmm. yeah and you can imagine there is much more people on the in the streets than in the sure. parks so the true mm. risk is much higher in the parks mm -hmm. but the mm -hmm. problem is that this data is just in spain for example just given like that there's no analysis so the, Meantime, in the the interesting part of that would be that to change the assumption, like so, you start off with the assumption. The hypothesis right. that is our hypothesis is this: is that high Kelvin temperature, uniform lighting in these kinds of spaces will cause an increase in violent incidents, and then go see what you can find. Instead of saying our hypothesis is that more light equals safety. And so that's like you have to start with the right hypothesis and either and then let it be proven or disproven. Right. That would be I mean, I'm not a scientist. I sell light bulbs every day. But um, that would be my assumption of how you'd go about looking for it. But I don't think it's ever happened. I don't think Jane, I'd, I've never seen a study or anything that says what we did was look to see if artificial light at night caused an increase in violence. Never, yeah. been, never been done. I would say that's never been it's studied. It's no, an amazing the, it, point you raised, Mike, that we are we are starting with an assumption and that's framing the information that's coming through. And it, to, to reverse the assumption is a, a wonderful way to potentially turn it all on its head. Because I think what we're all intuitively saying and noticing is that more light is not necessarily safer. It can be. There's exceptions, of course, but it's not always safer. And that's the assumption that's really what's been happening and that's been guiding the increasing planetary light levels 
So I, I think that's an absolutely fascinating point that we may be starting from the wrong assumption. Alejandro, I want to know, uh, we're coming up on the end of the show. Um, is there anything, any last points that you want to raise? What's on the horizon for your work? And what do you wonder about? Well, we are working a lot on trying to, to give the evidence on, on many of the things that I have been telling you. Uh, for example, what you have just said, how the light pollution globally is increasing. Uh, we have a mm -hmm. paper, Chris, Chris and I, uh, that we're showing that, but I think we need to do more on, on the same direction. We are working a lot on, on that. We have to give color to the, to the light pollution in the world. And I think right now, technically, we have all, all the tools to fix the problem. Uh, we don't have yet the political and uh, citizens push to make it happen. Mm -hmm. yeah. And mm -hmm. many times, it's very frustrating for us. It's easier to convince the government that our colleagues in the environmental area. No? So for me, uh, that's one of my goals, is that the same as plastics were ignored for so long, and now yes. there is a big hype about them. Mm, light pollution is now the moment. Now I have the technology to fix it. Yeah? Yeah, for sure. It's a solvable mm, it's a problem. That, it's a solvable yeah, problem. We, yeah, so I think the problem is going to be solved. The, pr the question is, we are going to solve this problem in five Amen, years brother. or in 30? Yeah. I'm saying, on my yeah. estimate, Jane and I are working hard on this. I, I'm saying 10 <laughs> years. I think we can tackle the, like, tackle the OECD, say, like, you know, our rich we the Western nations or however you want to frame that. I think we can tackle, because they're the problem. It's not Africa that's the problem, right? It's like... The, the the Western world, some big cities in South America, China, Japan, like there's a certain amount of countries that are, are we could tackle that in 10 years for sure. And everybody in lighting is going to make a killing. That's the best part for I'm trying to tell people. <laughs> like this is a lighting yeah. boom. This is a lighting boom or a darkness boom. But yes, Jane, Jane's calling it off. So. Go ahead, Jane. Well, I just want to <laughs> I want to keep this to an hour for our listeners and we could talk to you all day. So sure. let's have you back on Alejandro. Sure. And thank you so much to our listeners for making it through. Um, thank you to Alejandro. You raised some fascinating points in this discussion. I think really helped push the thought forward. Mm -hmm. So thank you so much um, for being a guest on Starving for Darkness. My pleasure. One more note before you go, folks, and that is to tell you a little bit about the magicians, the magical people down at Evluma, who've created the OmniMax LED replacement lamp, Greg Eric. That's E-V-L-U-M-A dot com for some magical thinking. So they have different wattage options uh, with different socket, medium mogul base, and the Kelvin temperatures we talked about at the beginning, 2K up to 5K. And well, we don't need size. to go past 27K, Greg Eric. We don't need to, and you don't have no. to with this. Do you want to match that magical gaslight look? Bring some beauty back. Come on, right. folks. Check that out. Sell them out. Go to evluma.com right now and sell them out on that beautiful OmniMax omnidirectional LED replacement lamp. Tell me a little bit about that photo cell backup thing that's on that, that bulb as well, Greg Eric. Yeah, so it's got their photo control fail safe. So what, what it does is over time, it learns how the photo cell and the fixture worked actually into the, it's built into the OmniMax bulb itself. And then if your photo cell ever fails in the fixture, the bulb will take over and keep that photo cell moving the way it was. So you don't need to replace the photo cell. It's all built right into the bulb. So it's going to look like gaslight, but they're not gaslighting you. And I'm, t I'm not gaslighting you when I tell you that this is magical technology. Go to EVLUMA.com. Thanks for listening.